If you wanna make sure that you get crypto airdrops in 2024, then you definitely need to make sure that your wallet addresses don't get marked as bots or sybils, which basically means someone that's trying to use multiple wallets to farm the same airdrop to game the system. Because if your wallet gets flagged as a sybil or a bot, then it's possible that you could be excluded from airdrops that you spend hours and hours and lots of capital trying to farm. So there's actually a few things that you can do to make sure that you don't get qualified as a Sybil. And in this video, I'm gonna walk you through the best strategies to make sure that this doesn't happen to you and that all of your hard work to farm these airdrops will actually pay off. So let's start with the basics of how you should set up your wallet structure for airdrop farming. And then I'll get into some actual specific things that you can do proactively to make sure that your wallet doesn't get flagged as a Sybil. But before you even start, when you're funding a crypto wallet, could be an Ethereum wallet or really any other wallet, Solana wallet, whatever you're farming airdrops with, you want to make sure that you keep each of your airdrop farming wallets completely separate and segregated from each other. So that means when you set up a fresh wallet, you're going to want to send money to it, ETH, Solana, or whatever token you're using from a centralized exchange because centralized exchanges like Binance and Coinbase, etc., have large hot wallets where they send money out when you process a transaction. And so it's impossible for anyone to know whose account on Coinbase or Binance or whatever that money is coming from. So once you've got a fresh wallet set up and you sent money to it from a centralized exchange, the next step is to make sure that you don't somehow cross pollinate your different airdrop farming wallets. So I would never send money from this CryptoCove.eth wallet to another wallet that I'm using to farm the same airdrops because that could potentially be flagged as civil activity. And it's definitely a best practice to make sure that you don't do this. Now, you can even take this another step further because, for example, in one MetaMask wallet using the same seed phrase, you can have a number of different accounts and you can use these different accounts technically to farm the same airdrops. But if you wanna take it even one step further, for example, on this MetaMask account on one seed phrase, I can spin up a bunch of different wallets, but if I wanted to be even more safe, I could actually use a different profile on Chrome or Brave. I could use a completely different browser altogether. I could use different wallets on the same browser. So for example, I could have MetaMask, and then I could also have Phantom and Rabi all in the same browser. And if you wanted to take it even to the next level, you could even use different devices altogether. Now the ultimate step would be to use different devices, to use different profiles, and to also use a VPN so that your IP address is spoofed. But honestly, I feel like that's probably overkill. And it's actually very possible that even if you used the same wallet seed phrase with a bunch of different accounts spun up, you'd probably be fine as long as you fund each of those separately from a centralized exchange and never co-mingle funds between them. So those are the basics of setting up your airdrop farming wallet structure. But beyond that, there's a lot of things that you can do to make sure that each of your wallets don't get flagged as Sybil or bots and then excluded from airdrops. Now, the only thing I'll say here is that it can be quite expensive to do all the things that I'm going to show you. And you don't actually need to do 100% of them, but as long as you hit some of the main ones, I think then you'll probably be good. However, it's not gonna be cheap because in many cases, you do have to transact on the Ethereum mainnet in order to actually do a bunch of these things. So let's get into the actual list step-by-step step of what you can do once you've funded your wallet and you've set up your airdrop farming structure to make sure that you don't get excluded from airdrops. And like I just hinted at, one of the main things that you can do is actually transact on the Ethereum mainnet. So why is this going to be helpful to you? Well, quite simply, if someone is running a massive operation where they're trying to farm a thousand wallets across all these different apps and protocols, they're not going to want to spend the gas fees that it takes to transact on ETH mainnet. And they're going to want to keep recycling the same pools of money over and over and over again as much as possible. And so by transacting on Ethereum mainnet, where the gas fees are unfortunately quite expensive sometimes, that will set your wallet apart from some other ones where maybe they get funded from a centralized exchange to an L2 like base, and then they just rotate that same pool of money around different L2s, but never hit ETH mainnet. So even just by doing a couple of transactions on the Ethereum mainnet, that can help you out a lot, I think. Now, the next important point to mention is the minimum balance criteria. So as we saw with StarkNet, they excluded wallets that didn't have at least 0.005 ETH at the time of the snapshot in their wallet. And so you can take this principle and apply it across all of the different networks that you're trying to farm. But I also think it probably should apply to the ETH mainnet. So I would actually recommend keeping at least a minimum balance of 0.01 ETH, if you can, on the mainnet. And then also 
on different networks that you're trying to fire them, like ZK Sync, Mode, Scroll, whatever, you should probably also keep a minimum balance on each of those. And the rationale for this is pretty self-explanatory because if someone is running a massive civil operation, it's gonna be way too costly for them to keep a minimum balance of 0.01 ETH on every different network on every different wallet. Their objective is to constantly cycle through that money as much as possible to increase transaction count and transaction value and volume, but it really can be beneficial for you to keep that minimum balance. And that is a pretty strong anti civil measure that you can take. And if you take that principle and multiply it across multiple different blockchains, so for example, with this public wallet here that I have, I've got funds on all of these different blockchains right here. And this is obviously helping distinguish my wallet from Sybil's because I have a balance on each of these different networks, which realistically a Sybil farmer just couldn't do. But aside from those, pretty basic things. There's actually a lot of other more proactive steps that you can take. And one of those is to mint or purchase a .eth or an ENS domain name. So this is on the Ethereum mainnet. And by doing this, this actually helps you qualify for having an Ethereum mainnet transaction. But if you buy a .eth domain name, you can mint one on ens.domains, or you can actually use vision.io to purchase or mint these domains. Now the price to mint one of these for a five or more character domain is $5 per year, plus the Ethereum gas fees. And currently, ETH gas fees have been quite high. So this one transaction right here could easily cost you upwards of $30, $40, $50, depending on the gas fees when you mint. And if you mint a three digit or a four digit domain name, then it's even more expensive. But it's very unlikely that bots and Sybils will mint and actually link a .eth domain to their wallet address because it's simply too expensive. And so by doing this, that's already, again, setting your wallet apart from others. Now, you can actually apply this as well to all of the different L2s that you're trying to farm. So one example is the scroll name service, and you can mint a dot .scroll domain name, and you can do the same for Linea, ZK Sync, Mode, etc. Now, if you only have the money to do one of these, I think the dot .eth is the most important. However, if you do have enough funds to mint your domain across all of the different L2s as well, then that's definitely a good idea to do so. And it will be a lot cheaper on the L2s because the transaction fees are gonna be a lot lower. All right, next up, one thing that you can do, especially as it relates to farming layer two airdrops is to use official bridges whenever possible. So if you're trying to farm ZK Sync or Scroll or the Mode Network, et cetera, you wanna use their actual native bridge at least one time. And most Sybil or bots won't do this because it's quite simply more expensive. Usually you have to start by bridging from the Ethereum mainnet to the layer two, and the cost for doing so can be quite high. So for example, because of the ETH gas fees right now, the cost to use the ZK Sync official bridge is gonna be almost 50 US dollars. But if you wait until transaction fees go down, you can get it for a lot less than that. Next up, something that you can do that will really set your wallet apart is to set up a safe wallet. Now you can do this on the Ethereum mainnet. Again, it's gonna be a lot more expensive and you can already see all of this stuff is starting to add up. So if you do each and every one of these things that I'm mentioning right here, it could cost hundreds of dollars to set your wallet up as an anti civil wallet. Now you don't need to do all of it, I just wanna give you as many options as possible, and then you can pick and choose which ones you think are the highest value to you. But the safe wallet is a good one to do because you're setting up your wallet address as a multi-sig. And for the Arbitrum airdrop, that was actually a multiplier, so you got a larger airdrop if you are a multi-sig wallet signer. Now here, I've created a two of two safe wallet on the Ethereum mainnet. So to send a transaction, I need to sign it with two different wallets, but you can also set these safe wallets up on a bunch of different L2s, including, for example, ZK Sync Era, which could be a good idea if you're trying to get that airdrop. So set up a safe wallet and then sign a couple of transactions with it. I've got actually a full tutorial video showing how to do this because it's a little bit complicated and I'm not gonna go fully in depth on how to go through this process. But the safe wallet multi-sig is a great anti sybil Next up, we've got Gitcoin grants. So this is basically making donations to public goods projects on the Ethereum ecosystem. And the reason why you might want to do this is because it will help you later on when you're trying to get a Gitcoin pass passport, but also just as a standalone, it's very, very unlikely that massive bot and civil farmers are going to actually be making donations to public goods. So by doing this, 
that sets your wallet apart from others as well. Next up, we've got voting on governance proposals. So snapshot.org is one of the main sites for the Ethereum ecosystem, where if you hold and stake certain tokens, you can participate in the DAO governance votes. So for example, the Stargate DAO for STG stakers, or if you just hold Arbitrum tokens, ARB tokens, you can vote on the Arbitrum DAO. Same thing for Optimism, and there's lots of other ones. And if you actually hold and stake these tokens and then vote on these governance proposals when they come up, that could help you out as well. Because again, Silver Farmers are trying to constantly recycle their funds and it's unlikely that they would stake a significant amount in STG tokens and then hold it there long term to be able to participate in governance. Okay, next up, this is one that I actually don't hear people talking about that much, but I feel like it's actually a good thing to do, which is to provide liquidity long term to DEXs in the ecosystem. So this right here is SyncSwap, which is a DEX that you can use on ZK Sync, Linea, and Scroll. And if you provide liquidity to one of these platforms, it doesn't have to be SyncSwap, and hold it there long term, that's a great anti sybil as well. Because nobody that's farming with a thousand wallets is going to be able to provide long term liquidity. It locks up their money and it prevents them from recycling and generating transaction count and transaction volume. So this is definitely a good strategy and I do recommend providing some liquidity long term for each of the different L2s that you're trying to farm at least. And all the ones on SyncSwap are good targets right now. Now, in addition to all these things that I've just talked about, there's also a whole category of proof of humanity attestations that you can actually acquire. Some of them cost money in order to do. Some of them require you to actually prove your humanity by uploading identity documentation or providing video proof that you are a human and not a bot. And you don't need to do each and every single one of them, but if you hit at least, let's say, one to three of the different things that I'm going to mention in this next segment here, then that will help you out a lot. So let's start with Galaxy because they've got a couple of things. For starters, they've got their Galaxy Web3 score, which you can get by paying a fee in order to actually acquire it. So again, annoying, it does cost money to get this, but then it basically checks all of your different on-chain transaction history, as well as some social things. And the higher the Web3 score that you get, the more likely it is that you will be considered human, not a bot. But also Galaxy has a passport. So I've minted one of these from Galaxy. I believe it costs something like $20. And in order to get one, you did have to provide a picture of photo identification. But then it gives you this soulbound NFT, which provides ZK proof that you are a human being. So it's not like Galaxy is actually showing your identity documentation to other people, but just by holding this soulbound NFT in your wallet, it proves that you did at some point verify your identity. Now, aside from the Galaxy Passport, there's also actually this protocol called Proof of Humanity, where you have to upload video or photo evidence that you are a human being, but you also do have to pay a 0.1 ETH collateral deposit. And then if your Proof of Humanity gets accepted, you get that back. There's also the Gitcoin Passport, and this is definitely a good one to do if you can. If you get a Gitcoin Passport score over 20, then that helps you prove your humanity. And in order to do that, you collect all of these different stamps, each of which provides you with points based on how hard it is to get those stamps. And so for example, some of them are quite simple, like connecting a Discord or a Twitter account. Some of them are more difficult, like for example, Ethereum activity is based on how long your wallet has been active and what different transactions you've done. But basically you just try and hit as many of these different things as you can in order to get your total score above 20 and then you're good to go on the Gitcoin Passport. And I've got a full tutorial on the Gitcoin Passport on my channel as well if you wanna check it out in depth and how to actually get that score. But another thing I'll say is that each of these different items taken alone could also help you do the proof of humanity. So for example, Trust the Labs or Holonym. These are all different things that you can do separately from the Gitcoin Passport that are great to help you prove proof of humanity and prevent you from being labeled a Sybil as well. So if you can mint a Lens Protocol handle or if you can purchase one on an NFT marketplace, that is great. You can also use phyland.xyz to help you visualize your on-chain identity. There's DGEN score, although this one is a bit expensive because the cost to mint is 0.1 ETH. And it's actually quite difficult to get a DGEN score above 700 points in order to be able to mint. You have to be in the top 10% of active Ethereum addresses. And then of course, for the Linea L2 airdrop, they've got a bunch of different things that they consider as proof of humanity. So I did the Trusta Labs. I could also do Gitcoin Passport here. But each of these different things here 
can help you prove your humanity. You don't need to do all of them. You just need to do a couple. So that is, I think, a pretty comprehensive list of things that you can do to make sure your wallet is not excluded from airdrops. Now, let me tell you what I've done with this public wallet, this demo wallet here. I think it's actually a little bit overkill, but it will definitely make sure that my wallet is not excluded from airdrops. So for starters, I do have a .eth domain name, CryptoCove.eth, and I've also minted a domain name on pretty much every L2, so .scroll, .linea, et cetera. I've obviously transacted on the ETH mainnet and I try to maintain a decent minimum balance on every L2 that I'm trying to farm as well as on ETH mainnet. I've used the official bridges for each L2 that I'm trying to farm. I've got a multi-sig safe wallet on the mainnet where I've done a couple of transactions. I've donated to Gitcoin grants. I've voted in governance on the snapshot DAO. I provide long-term LP to a bunch of different DEXs. On Galaxy, I do have a Galaxy Passport. I haven't completed Proof of Humanity, but I have a Gitcoin Passport with a score over 20. I've completed the Linea Proof of Humanity using Trusta Labs. I don't have a DGEN score, but I do have a Phyland page and I have a Lens handle. So all of that stuff taken together, I think makes my wallet a pretty strong anti sybil but I think that's also a little bit of overkill. So for example, I don't think you need to have the Galaxy Passport and the Gitcoin score and also to have Trusta Labs, for example. You can probably pick one of those things and then combine it with some of the more basic tasks like transacting on ETH mainnet, having a .eth domain, and also making sure that you keep that minimum balance. But if you take all of this into consideration and then make sure that you don't co-mingle funds between different wallets that you're trying to farm airdrops with, I can pretty much guarantee that you'll be good and that you will hit some airdrops in 2024. So good luck, hopefully you found this useful, and I'll see you in the next video.